So there's a lot of nonsense going around about the vaccines. And I think there's anti-science on all sides. A number of you have requested that I take a little bit of a longer look into COVID and vaccines. So let's do that. Before we begin, my name is Samir Dosani, and I'm a health coach and an anthropologist based in Johannesburg, South Africa. Please do remember to like and subscribe to the channel if you enjoy this content and if you want me to do more videos like this. Before we start, I'm not a doctor and none of this is medical advice. I'm giving you my opinion based on the scientific papers that I read as someone who reads a whole lot of scientific papers. So the main issue that's coming up right now is not vaccines per se. I think that the discussion on that was probably live four or five months ago. But there's this question about universal vaccination, right? So some countries in Europe, notably France, have sort of mandated vaccines. Um, is that a good thing or what? Now, if we look at the data in terms of COVID deaths, I don't think there's any argument that vaccination is not a good thing, right? So uh, vaccinations have greatly reduced COVID deaths. This uh, data that I'm about to show you, this is from Israel. So what you'll see is that although though deaths are up a little bit now, um, they're way down from the peak, although we are sort of near the peak of an epidemic of a sort of a spike in the cases. That's despite the fact that Israel has something like 70 or more than 70% of their population fully vaccinated. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about this, but in terms of reducing death, I don't think there's any what's to, what's to say. I mean, it's pretty clear that it's reduced death significantly. Um, and of course, we all want to go back to something like 2019, <laughs> something like normal. Um, and I think vaccines are clearly part of the path for getting there, right? Um, now, that said, are there legitimate reasons why someone wouldn't want to get the vaccine? Sure, there are. Uh, in the U.S., there are religious groups that refuse to get any kind of vaccination, which you know the U.S. has allowed them that right for many, many years. Um, and there are certain people who may have rare blood clotting disorders who should definitely consult their doctor before getting vaccinated. And then there's some people um, who I've spoken to who didn't have a very good re reaction to their first dose. So I would say, yeah, don't get the second dose if you had a really, really bad, um, almost an allergic reaction to the first dose. Again, consult your doctor for all this. I'm not telling you what to do. The problem for those people and really for anyone with a chronic condition is this. Yeah, there's a risk from the vaccine, but nearly all of those risks, like if, you, if you're likely to have a bad reaction to the vaccine, you're even more likely to have a bad reaction to COVID itself. And when we're dealing with more and more contagious variants, I think we all have to just assume that we're going to get COVID one day if we haven't already, right? So you and your health providers have to have a discussion about whether the risk from the vaccine is worse than the risk from COVID. And in some rare cases, it might be. But, but for most people, the risk from COVID is equal or greater to the risk from the vaccine, right? Let's get to the question of mandatory vaccination. So what is the logic behind mandating vaccines? Well, until now, the logic was herd immunity. So um, this is how, you know, in the past hundred years or so, we've been able to completely get rid of some diseases like whooping cough, measles, smallpox, polio. These are diseases that have effectively disappeared uh, over the past hundred years. Because when enough of a population, when enough of the population develops immunity, the virus doesn't have enough hosts to continue to reproduce, and it more or less dies out. Right. So um, these viruses, they rely on a certain percentage of the population being vulnerable. They rely on a host population where they can reproduce, um, and this is why you know, and, and that that population needs to be of a certain size. So the thinking with COVID is, you need at least 30, 40 percent of people who aren't vaccinated, who don't have immunity. For COVID to continue. That was the thinking, right? Um, but COVID aside, this is why, again, those religious communities in the U.S. who don't get vaccinated, the fact that, you know, some one, two, three percent of the population don't get vaccinated, um, it's not enough to allow the virus to persist. So whooping cough is extinct even in um, areas that don't get vaccinated, right? That's what herd immunity means. The issue when we talk about respiratory viruses, when we talk about coronaviruses, when we talk about rotaviruses, when we talk about influenza viruses, is that as far as I'm aware, and I've looked pretty deep, uh, I can't find a documented case of herd immunity, right? These viruses are constantly mutating and they're quite seasonal. So um, what happens with flu viruses, for example, is that they will, um, you know, the next year's flu virus will sort of be discovered in pigs and chickens in China just before the flu season or six months before. And that they, they test those pigs and chickens to understand how to make the flu vaccine, right? And it has to be done every year, right? So 
Um, those things are mutating so much that our natural immunity is not enough to cause herd immunity, um, and our vaccinations are not even enough to cause herd immunity, right? So what do I mean by all that? Well, let's look at data from two countries that have very high vaccination rates. Let's look at Israel and Iceland, right? Um, so I've shown Israel. Let's look at Iceland for a second, right? So if we look, um, so Iceland by far has the most number of vaccines. The highest percentage of vaccinated people in the world are in Iceland. It's somewhere around 80%, right? So, but even then, this is from August 10th, so they reached the 80% mark some, some months ago. Um, even then, we have an outbreak of COVID in Iceland. I can show you these figures here. So you can see, in fact, they've, they hit their highest number of cases on August 5th, okay? Higher than any other outbreak, okay? So the idea of herd immunity, I think it's lost because that's, that's the most percentage we can get until we have vaccines that are approved for use in children. And what we're seeing is that we're even getting COVID outbreaks in the most heavily vaccinated country, countries. So herd immunity, I think it's safe to say more or less off the table. Maybe I'm being slightly premature. Maybe we need to get to 90% or something, but it's not happening anytime soon. In that context, who should be getting the vaccine? Well, there are two things to consider. The absence of herd immunity coupled with the protective effects of the vaccine itself essentially means that anyone who wants to should be getting the vaccine, right? If you get the vaccine, your risk of mortality and morbidity from COVID is greatly decreased. And that's especially true for the huge percentage of the population that suffers from metabolic disease. So in the US, one study found that 88% of people have at least one of the markers of metabolic syndrome. This may be one reason why the US has been particularly hard hit by COVID. Um, but if that study is true, then the 88% of people who are at risk in the U.S., I mean, they definitely need to be getting the vaccine, right? If you think you're not in that category, if you think, well, wait a sec, I don't have any markers of metabolic syndrome, I'm, I'm in perfect health, my blood sugar is not high. The first thing I would do is just test that hypothesis, right? I think I'm healthy, let me get my blood work done. <laughs> um, and, you know, depending on where you, where you live, that may cost between $10 and $50 U.S., or hopefully you live in a country with a national health care system, it won't cost you anything. Um, if your fasting blood sugar is below 100 or 5.4 if you use the British system, and if your postprandial blood sugar, that's your blood sugar two hours after eating, is below 120 or below 6.7, then congratulations. I don't think you have much to worry about. You're doing okay. If you want to be super sure, you can also test your triglycerides so you can get a cholesterol panel done. Ignore the LDL. LDL not relevant. But check your triglycerides. If your triglycerides are below 150, or 1.7 if you use the UK units, um, and your glucose levels are normal, like I said, you're probably in great metabolic health. Um, maybe you don't need the MAC vaccine, um, but the other thing to consider is, even if you get the vaccine, you're gonna have a very good immune response to it. You're in good health, you can get the vaccine or not get the vaccine, your risk is kind of not gonna be very high one way or another, okay? Um, one more thing to bring into this calculation is not just personal risk, but the extent to which you might pose a risk to someone else. So if you're living with an elderly person or someone who can't get the vaccine because they're immunocompromised, um, that may be a reason for you to get the vaccine. Of course, it's not a guarantee that you're not gonna pass on the virus and you still need to do things like hand washing and maybe physical distancing and so on from the person who's uh, at risk. Getting that vaccine will reduce your chances at least a little bit of passing it on. So that's something to consider. So just to simplify a number of questions you should be asking at the personal level about getting vaccinated. Number one, are you at high risk? If so, get vaccinated. And remember that a pr pretty significant number of us are at high risk, right? So in the US, I give the example, it's close to 90%. Number two, might you have one of the rare conditions that are contraindicated with vaccination, right? So again, those rare blood clotting disorders and so on. If so, you should already have consulted your doctor. You should probably know that you're in that category. Um, number three, are you in contact with someone who's in a high risk pool, like an elderly parent or grandparent? If so, you better get vaccinated and make sure that in addition to vaccination, you have some additional security measures to protect that person from exposure. Again, washing hands irregularly is probably the best thing anyone can do. Note what I'm not saying here. I'm not saying that everyone should get vaccinated because of herd immunity. And I'm not saying that the risk of having a, an adverse reaction to the vaccine is zero, right? As I mentioned earlier, herd immunity doesn't seem likely at this time. Uh, so coercive measures like we're seeing in France and elsewhere to get people to vaccinate, I mean, they don't really serve much of a point. Why are we doing that? Even Iceland is having some issues with intensive care unit capacity and they have an 80% vaccination rate, right? So 
Um, but I should stress in the case of Iceland, they haven't really had any deaths. So the vaccines are working. It's just that they're not eliminating the spread of the disease, right? So again, if we go back to Iceland, so they would have been fully vaccinated or the vaccines would have been introduced some point around here, you know, um, February, March, April. By this point, they were fully vaccinated. And from that point onward, there has literally been only one death. The number has gone on from 29 to 30. Now, okay, Iceland, small country, not very dense population. There's all kinds of other factors here. But the fact that you can have such a massive outbreak, the, the biggest outbreaks that they've had ever, and you can see even this cumulative number, you see the spike in cases, it's much bigger than any previous spike in cases. So you have the biggest spike in cases and deaths is flat. I think that tells you something about, you know, the vaccine is definitely working. Regardless of that, I don't think coercive measures are warranted. If someone doesn't want to get the vaccine and there are justifiable reasons not to get the vaccine, um, it's not really hurting society as a whole because herd immunity is not happening. So vulnerable people should just be, you know, should be vaccinated and will have to take additional cautions as well. That said, OK, so let's let's talk to so someone who doesn't want to get vaccinated. What might they be thinking? Well, according to some of the studies, the risk to the general population of having a fatal adverse reaction to the vaccine is about, for a healthy person, is about one in 100,000, maybe a little bit less, right? That's not that different to the risk of a metabolically healthy person having a fatal case of COVID, right? So again, most of the COVID cases we're talking about people, I think the average age of death in most countries is above the age of 80. In most countries, it's about the same as life expectancy. Um, and if you're not in that category, and if you don't have comorbidities, your chance is like practically pretty close to zero, one in 100,000, one in 200,000. So your risk from the vaccination and your risk from COVID, if you're in that population, are about the same. And so given that, I can understand someone saying, ah, I don't really want to, maybe there's some long-term issues, blah, 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 that we haven't heard of, although I find those arguments um, not very coherent. Um, but whatever, I mean, you know, if you feel like you have just as much of a chance of dying of COVID as you do from the vaccine, if you know that you're in the, the metabolically healthy category, do what you like. I don't think you should be forced to do anything. Okay. Okay. So how does this whole thing end? Meaning how does this two year, going on two years of the pandemic, how is that going to end? Um, some people are not going to like this answer, but it ends when we stop looking for cases. So if you look at places where vaccination rates are high, again, I've shown you data from Israel, I've shown you data from Iceland, you can fool yourself into thinking that you've got a serious case, you've got a serious problem if you just look at this number for Iceland, right? You can, you can make yourself believe that. Even let's look at, um, look at Israel. Let's look at, um, at the um, excess mortality in Israel, right? If you, if you just look at the cases in Israel, right? You can make yourself believe that you've got a serious problem, right? But when you're looking at, you know, death from all causes, which is what we have here, we say it is above the norm, but it's not massively crazy like it was in October of 2020. That seems to be when cases spiked. And 30% above the norm is certainly something to worry about. 5% above the norm could just be fluctuations, right? And this chart, I should say, also doesn't go far enough back. In order to really understand this, you need to go four or five years backwards and see, have they had soft, quote unquote, soft years, meaning that there weren't a lot of excess deaths between 2015 and 2019, then we would have expected more deaths in 2020 and 21 um, anyway. Those are the kind of measures we need to be looking at in order to understand. If you just look for cases, this, this is never going to end. We're going to be locking down in... Uh, in 2035, we're going to be talking about when will the lockdown end, right? That said, there are, of course, issues. There are this, this whole year and a half has exposed some very serious issues. To me, the most serious one, and why, one reason why I call COVID a syndemic and not a pandemic, is a lack of medical infrastructure, both globally and specifically in the global south, right? So I think in New York specifically, when we had that outbreak, I believe it was um, April, May of 2020, I think that showed that even so-called, you know, developed countries don't have enough healthcare infrastructure. They aren't spending enough on healthcare to ensure that they're taking care of their own population. In India, earlier this year, um, that was uh, March and April of this year, that was terrible. The country was overwhelmed. But when we look at the actual numbers, so when we look at the, the population adjusted numbers, India didn't have one of the worst outbreaks. It didn't, it didn't really... It didn't lose as many people. It didn't have as many, even as many cases as some other places, but it just had one of the 
worst prepared health systems, um, which is why it was such a, on a human level, it was such an absolute disaster, right? Um, vaccine apartheid is also part of this. Many countries, I think Canada is the worst offender, have way more doses of the vaccine than is needed, right? And they've ordered more and more is coming. Other countries, most of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, are still waiting to get enough doses so that everyone can get their first dose or the second dose, right? And, and meanwhile, by the way, Europe and other countries are talking about third doses and fourth dose doses, boosters, and so on. So everyone who wants a vaccine in the global south should be able to get it. This is one of the ways, as I mentioned, we can talk about COVID being a syndemic and not a pandemic. Syndemic is when two things, two things come together to cause a big problem, right? And the other way in which two things are coming together to cause a big problem um, is metabolic disease. Now, this is relevant for everyone, but it seems to be especially relevant for developed countries. When we look at the chief risk factors for having a bad case of COVID, um, and this is well published, well publicized by now, you can look at all the studies. The first is always old age. As I mentioned earlier, the average rate of the average death age in most countries is about the same as life expectancy. Okay. Um, but the next highest risk factor tends to be things like diabetes, kidney disease, obesity, high blood pressure. These are all the symptoms of what I work on with my clients every single day, which is metabolic syndrome. What causes metabolic syndrome? Eating too many carbs, eating too many seed oils, processed foods in general, not getting enough sunlight, not getting enough exercise. In other words, being a modern middle class human being, right? This is the main risk factor. And this brings me to to the question of a solution, to the extent that there is a solution. Um, so herd immunity is not an option, and, and that's unfortunate. But fortunately, the disease is not particularly serious for those who are not immunocompromised. If we worry about what we can change instead of what we can't, so what we can change is we can eat healthier, we can, we can eat whole foods, animal foods, we can get enough sleep, we can exercise more, we can maybe include some inter intermittent fasting into our routines. If everyone did those things, the death rate from this virus would plummet. It would probably be less than influenza even. Now, it's important to say that the death rate will not be zero, will never be zero, right? It simply cannot be, right? This is a respiratory virus, and respiratory viruses are a leading cause of death, especially among the elderly. But it can be much less than what it is today if we take care of our metabolic health. The last thing I'll say, and this is a bit speculative because we don't have all the data, um, but viruses tend to mutate in a way that they become less deadly over time, right? This is just how respiratory viruses work. Respiratory viruses care about becoming more infectious, right? They want to be able to spread to as many hosts as possible. They want to live in as many organisms as possible. They don't want to kill that organism because when they kill the organism, they can't survive in the organism. Now, this can still be a problem because if something is a little bit deadly but a lot more infectious, and I think Delta may fall into this category, the Delta variant may fall into this category, then it can actually end up killing a lot more people and therefore it looks like it's more deadly, right? What do I mean by that? Well, let's say the infection mortality rate, so there's two different numbers, right? There's the case mortality rate, C, um, case fatality rate, CFR, and there's the infection fatality rate, right? At the moment, the best estimates, so a case, in order to be, become a case, you've got to sort of end up in the hospital. In most countries, we find the case fatality rate is about 1%, right? So about 1% of those who end up in the hospital will unfortunately end up passing away. But for every one of those, there's another number of people, I would say about probably about 100 people, who get the infection but don't end up in the hospital, right? So if my numbers are correct, or let's say it's, it's 2 out of 100 people, the infection mortality rate would be you know, 0.2% um, in COVID. Now, let's say in the case of the Delta variant, let's say that that infection mortality rate were to decrease from 0.2% to 0.1%, but the percentage of the population who gets infected increases from 20% to 50%, right? So you have a, a halving of the infection fatality rate, but the, the uh, number of the population exposed goes up by more than double. So the end result, you've, you've halved one number, you've more than doubled the other number. Um, any, you know math student will be able to tell you your overall number of deaths is going to go up. And therefore, it might look, if we don't have good estimates of the infection fatality rate and so on, it might look as if this is actually a more deadly variant. Right? As I say, we don't have great data on this, so a lot of this is speculation. At the end of the day, we all have to be prepared to get the virus. It's not going anywhere with or without the vaccines, right? Um, getting the vaccine 
is probably the most important thing you can do to make sure that your body will be able to have a good immune response when you get exposed to the virus, right? And what the vaccine does is it makes sure that your body has seen the virus in a controlled setting, in a sort of non-lethal setting, before it gets exposed to the wild virus, right? Um, side effects are very rare, especially in healthy people. In fact, there's studies showing that the side effects are even rarer than, uh, than were thought in the trials. If you're worried about side effects, as I say, make sure that you're metabolically healthy when you get that injection. It's going to ensure that you have a robust immune response and a healthier immune response. The next most important thing to do is to make sure you're in good metabolic health in general. And the easiest way to do that, of course, we talked about measuring, but the things you can do, carb restriction, fasting, resistance training, um, we talk about those things elsewhere on this channel as well. Okay, so I hope that clarifies uh, certainly where I am on these issues. If I had to sum things up, I'd say chances are at an individual level, you have no reason not to go out and get the vaccine that you've been putting it off. But at a societal level, we have no reason to delay opening up because herd immunity is just not coming. Um, and that is not the fault of the vaccine hesitant of those who don't want to get vaccinated for whatever reason. It's not coming even in Iceland with massive amounts of, of vaccination. With that, I'm Samir and I'm a health coach and an anthropologist based in Johannesburg, South Africa. Thanks for listening.